Okay, well, welcome everybody uh, to the first of our Insight Business Focus webinars, Using Insight for Location Intelligence in a Post-Lockdown World. I'm Debbie Millard, Insight Engagement Manager, and I'll be hosting the session today. In terms of housekeeping, the webinar is being recorded and um, everyone is on mute at the moment, but please feel free to type questions to the chat or to me direct. Um, and if there's time at the end, we'll take questions. Taking the session today is Andy Maitlin and Sam Wilcoxon, both of, whom, both of whom I'm sure some of you have met before. Andy has been with CACI for 25 years and specialises in working directly with you as clients to help find solutions to your demographic and geographic challenges. Sam has been with CACI for 15 years and his focus is developing client understanding of insight and data sets, enabling you to make your business driven uh, decisions. With this webinar, we aim to show you how we can take CACI research that we've been reporting on over the past year and how you can analyze this in Insight. Andy will take you through some of the research and Sam will show you some outputs in Insight and how you might achieve this yourselves. I'll now hand over to Andy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our, uh, our first of a season of webinars. Uh, and before we start, uh, can I thank all of you who have filled out the recent survey that we sent out? Uh, these surveys inform us on the content and information that you want to hear about, and it gives uh, you the power to dictate the service you want to have from us. So anyone who hasn't filled it out yet, please do. Uh, and if you need the link, then please either email any of us uh, or the helpline and we'll, we'll send it across to you. Now, I know all of you on this session are very familiar with Insight, but I'm going to start this morning by reminding everyone about the amazing things that Insight can do with data and what Insight can do for you. And as it's a Friday morning, I thought I'd wake us all up. And the best thing to do that, to start the session with a video. So here is a video to introduce the amazing things Insight does. I don't know whether you really caught the key message from from that video while you were dancing to the upbeat tempo it's pretty pretty uh, loud in my headphones um, but the key message is that insight is an enabler of data and has been designed specifically to bring our data to life so you can realize and maximize the value of our data so what does insight uh, or how does insight help you make smarter decisions it simplifies complex questions. At its heart, it addresses three key questions. Who? Demographically understanding who customers are and what they want. Where? Geographically showing where customers are coming from or, or catchment coverage. And crucially, the so what questions. How much? Where next? How far? Who will be there? So far, I've been saying how Insight is an enabler of data. But you really start seeing value from data when you blend it. Insight seamlessly blends data, consumer data, market data, demographic data, site, third party, and your own data. And once this data has been blended in Insight, it supports accurate and intelligent data-driven decisions. 
I know I have almost been talking in hyperbole about the amazing things that uh, Insight can do. But let's get specific. What am I talking about? So here's all the things uh, that Insight can help you with, and, and there's obviously many more. But from customer insight to, to ge geographic visualization, from location planning to performance benchmarking, Insight places data at the heart of the decisioning process. And those four areas I've, I've highlighted are what we're going to focus on today. So this shows us uh, what Insight can do to maximize the value of our data. Uh, and now I've reminded you why Insight's so great, and I'm, I'm sure you didn't need reminding. Uh, I'm now going to go on to talk about the research and reporting that CACI have been doing over the last year. So I'll take this opportunity to give you an overview of the research and reports we've been publishing and some of the key findings. As some of you are aware, we at CSI have been very busy over the last year generating reports on the impact of COVID on all facets of our lives. Some of you will have signed up to these weekly reports. The first came out last May covering topics on lockdown trends and then we were adapting to the gradual easing, the impact of Eat Out to Help Out scheme, going right the way through the various lockdowns and tier systems through to the current increase in consumer confidence and movement. This research uh, and the analysis Sam will take you through later uses key CACI data sets that I'm pretty sure you'll be mostly familiar with. ACORN provides a full view of the UK population, easily describing your customers' lifestyles, affluence and demographics. Retail Footprint is CACI's comparison shopping model, describing over four and a half thousand shopping destinations, providing a detailed breakdown by catchment, spend and centre. The mobile app data may be a data set that is new to a few of you. We've partnered with Location Sciences to get granular understanding of anonymized ACORN coded movement of people. We've also carried out primary research surveys to understand thoughts and attitudes towards our new ways of living and working and pulled all this insightful data together in published reports. As I say, I know many of you have signed up to these reports, but we will give you details on how you can sign up to them. They are free uh, at the end of the session. So I'll now cover some of the key trends that have emerged from these reports over the last year. We've all had restrictions, but the impact of these have not been equal. And there's been a definite rise of localism. Well, there were signs of this pre-pandemic, but this trend has really accelerated over the last year. And Sam will be focusing on these two areas later on. There's an importance placed on safety, naturally, but based on our surveys, 87% are worried about safety right now. But more interestingly, 55% think that these uh, safety uh, elements will be here forever. And the rise of financial inequalities. We're all in the same storm, but not necessarily in the same boat. So what does this all mean for the future? And I will try and address that question at the end of the session. I'll now delve into some of these key findings in a bit more detail. So what we're looking at here is a graph of the last year with the, uh, the, the, uh, the x-axis along the bottom, giving you the uh, dates from last March right the way through to a couple of weeks ago with that uh, y-axis giving us the percentage of movement as compared to pre-pandemic levels. So here that we can see this overview of movement of people over the last year. Uh, and as we can see, uh, that the, the, the left hand side of that graph showing that we were all very good with the, the uh, government uh, rules and regulations with our movement dropping down to 32% of pre-COVID levels back in uh, March and April time. And then as things eased over the summer, the non-essential retail opened back up, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. So back around September time, we were up to 82% of pre-COVID levels. 
But as you can see, there were fluctuations with various restrictions. And now we're back to around 93% of previous movement as of a few weeks ago. But this headline figure is not equal across the country's demographics. So I'm now going to have a look at some specific demographics and how they were affected. So again, using that same scale, we're looking at five of the least affluent ACORN groups with the black line through there showing the UK average. All of these groups were moving above national average level. They were consistently higher levels of movement. So that's really saying these lower affluent groups are facing greater exposure to the virus. So what does that mean for our income? The inequality across uh, ACORN just isn't on how much we move, but also how much we can spend. This graph shows ACORN groups ranked by least reduction in disposable income, as represented by the red bars down the left. As we see, the, the mid green or the, the lighter green shows that where incomes haven't changed. And across the right, the dark green shows where these uh, incomes have uh, increased in the, in the uh, disposable income. So the second bar down, we see the large portion of dark green. This is lavish lifestyles. Their disposable in in uh, incomes have increased. And this is uh, due to the majority being able to work from home, no transport costs and leisure spend dropping. And then we see at the other end of the scale, the city sophisticates had the biggest hit on their income. And this was due to, to furlough and redundancy. But the positives here are that almost three quarters of us either have the same or more disposable income. But if our incomes weren't hugely effective overall, what does this mean for where we were shopping? So what we're looking at here is a graph showing the, the movement of people in retail footprint uh, classes from the city centres through to the transport hubs. And again, with a percentage of movement based on pre-pandemic levels uh, on, on the, the y-axis. But we're just across the, uh, the, the time scale is just over the last four months. And what it shows inequality across the ACORN um, is also the fact that it, uh, bringing through to the inequality is in our choice of shopping destinations. So with the city centres, regional malls and transport hubs being hit the hardest. And this graph shows, looking at the movement of people over the last four months, that you'll see these destinations are represented by the lowest three bars on the graph. And there's quite a gap between these location types and other shopping destinations. But if we look at the top end of the scale, and I'll thin that out, we can see that the local message has really resonated with the rural towns uh, as they're at the top of the, uh, the, the movement of people. And the safety aspect of retail parks has really translate, translated into a retention of footfall. So how can we visualize this? This change in shopping habits can visually be seen in this map, showing how central London is, is far down on pre-pandemic levels. The darker the blue, the lower the movement of people compared to pre-pandemic pre levels. And the more suburban locations in the red and dark red have far more movement and, and back up to near normal levels in some locations. I'll now hand over to Sam who will join the dots between this research and how to analyse lo locations of interest in insight. Thanks Andy, some really insightful snippets of information there. Just let me know when you can see my screen. Yep. Oh, okay, great. Um, which this leads us nicely onto the application now. So we're going to take some of the data used in those CACI reports at different stages of the pandemic and show how it can be applied using insight. Now, a key issue that lots of you have been talking about is how we can measure what's going on, uh, what's happening as the restrictions get lifted and how we can measure that. So it's important to note that it's a very dynamic situation. We've had to draw the line in the sand somewhere to measure the different levels of movement. 
So to understand the likely demand, we're going to compare movement levels from the first lockdown through to the height of summer and the eat out to help out scheme. And as you've seen already, the movement data is gathered from mobile phone apps. We're going to take a look at this from two different angles. Firstly, by appending the movement data to different demographic groups using ACORN. And secondly, by applying the movement data to different types of destinations using retail footprint. And to set the scene, we'll start by looking at these two stages of the pandemic on a national scale. It's been over a year ago now, but I'm sure everyone can remember at the start of the first national lockdown in April, there were strict re travel restrictions, orders to work from home and closures for all non-essential retail. And this all contributed to the reduction in movement levels. Now, ACORN can be applied geographically to give us a direct link between the demographic groups, their residential locations and their likely movements. The red areas on the map, like Newcastle, Liverpool and Birmingham, have high proportions of urban adversity. These are the lowest affluence groups and are much more likely to be essential workers. So they had to continue with their lives much closer to normal. Areas in blue, like Harrogate, Wilmslow and Epsom, are dominated by affluent achievers. These groups live in affluent commuter belts and with a high proportion being office-based, had the ability to work from home. And moving on to the summer now, as restrictions eased and the government encouraged everyone to go out and support the hospitality industry with the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. Not having to cook or wash up for a change was enough for some, but with half price food and drink on offer, it was really difficult to resist. Unsurprisingly, all ACORN groups showed a significant increase in movement, but some more than others. The blue areas of Edinburgh, Bristol and Brighton contain swathes of young affluent city sophisticates, which showed lowest levels of movement. And this might be surprising for some of you as they're metropolitan based, but this means they didn't have to travel as far to find somewhere to socialize. Furlough and redundancies also left some really feeling the pinch. The red areas around Inniskillen in Northern Ireland and Carmarthen in Wales are dominated by countryside communities and are some of the most rural in the UK. These groups don't have a choice whether to leave home. There isn't the option to shop locally and other services aren't as available. Using ACOM, we can start to pull apart these differences at a more local level. And an obvious place to highlight, as it was in the news quite a bit at the time, is Barnard Castle. But it's also a good example as it shows the polarisation between the movement of different demographic groups on that more detailed scale. OK, so this should be a familiar looking window for a lot of you, uh, our insight screen here. And I'm not going to show you all of this as a live demo with an insight, but I'll show you the outputs and explain a little about how it's created. The following slides have all been created from one map. And you can see down the left in the map properties window, there are a number of layers which I'll be turning on and off using the little eyes next to each layer. Next, I'll be adding on the layer called lockdown movement. This is a thematic layer showing high, medium and low levels of movement during April compared with pre-COVID. And rather than show you all these maps in an insight window like I've got now, I'm just going to expand this so you have a full view for the rest of the webinar. Because the movement data is appended to ACORN, this allows us to apply the, apply the population levels within a postcode sector or output area to get a better understanding at a local level. And here we can pull apart the differences in north, the northeast by utilizing the data you can see at the top left with the percentage of movement for April. And we can see the higher levels of movement for young hardship and difficult circumstances in the metropolitan areas and lower movement for the lavish lifestyles and executive wealth out into the suburbs. And using the same data principles, we're now looking at the same area for August. So higher levels of movement for the affluent but more rural areas in the West because they had to drive to get to any services or amenities. The less affluent metropolitan areas showing less movement as these groups chose to stay local. And rather than looking at where people live, we'll flip it on its head and talk about where people are travelling to. And this map shows the retail footprint centres, again thematically mapped, based on their class or type of destination. I'm sure this data set will be familiar with the retail property and media users out there. 
We have the dark blue city centre of Middlesbrough, surrounded by a number of suburban centres and a couple of local malls just a little further south. And I appreciate there's quite a lot going on here. But there's trends that we can apply to these locations as different destination classes show different interactions of movement. So as we move on, we're now looking at those same destinations, but from the viewpoint of the movement within these centres during the first lockdown compared to pre-COVID levels. From the biggest reduction in footfall in blue to the least impacted in red. And again, I appreciate there's still a lot going on in the view. So we're going to narrow the focus and take a look at a few in more detail. So now we're looking at a catchment showing 30 minute drive time around Barnard Castle. And if I can remind you of the slide Andy showed earlier in the top right, we'll be looking at a few specific retail footprint classes. Firstly, the locations in red are our rural towns, showing the highest levels of movement, but still down to 55% of pre-COVID levels. And like with the ACORN groups, this is aggregated data up to class level, so all the, all the, all the centres in the same class will have the same percentages. Next, we have the retail park of Bishop Auckland in the northeast of the catchment, down to 39% of pre-COVID movement. And finally, we have Darlington, which belongs to the major town centre class, whose movements were down to an average of just 36% of pre-COVID levels. So the rural towns actually maintain their interactions with consumers much better when compared with other classes. People wanted to support their independence in the local community. And as a reminder at this point, we are looking at general trends, but if people want to look at specific locations, we do have more detailed granular data. Now, if we compare that to what happened during the month of August, down on the bottom left, we can see that everything shifted up a gear and all destinations have increased levels of movement. As an average, the class of rural towns were nearly back to normal at 99%. If you were to look at some individual centres within this class, they were even above the movement levels seen before lockdown. Retail parks are also a big winner, held by the fact they're very accessible and also much easier to social distance with their large open spaces. Now we talked about measuring the changing demand within areas. So if we start by applying the population figures to that table at the bottom, we can see the centres, we can then model the centres based on the movement percentages within each class. So we can see the major town centre of Darlington has gone from just under 95,000 to just under 60,000. There's every possibility that some of these trends and behaviours are likely to stay. They're not just a consequence of the pandemic, although they have been massively accelerated by it. And if these centres don't provide the right offer, then people won't visit. So now we'll move back to using our own catchments and how we could reassess the demand for your products and services or an ad campaign. We'll look at this in its simplest terms to start with by looking at national averages and then model it against ACORN to see how the variation in group movement affects the overall demand. So if we look at the top left, we can see the national movement level at 76% for the month of August. And by adding the number of households this time within the drive time and applying it to the percentage movement, we end up with a reduced figure of just under 36,000. I'm not saying the number of households are going to change, but the audience is rapidly evolving, especially with the shift to hybrid working and more digital engagement. And this is just a simple method for re-evaluating your estate. Now we'll have a look at this using ACORN. The map here shows each postcode coloured by its ACORN group. Now we want to understand how the mix within that catchment will affect the overall catchment. On the left, again, are the ACORN group movement percentages for August. These have all been aggregated to give us national averages for ease of use in this analysis. So the ACORN movement data you can see here will actually be available to download from the Insight Hub next week. And if we add the ACORN group household figures and then apply to the corresponding percentages, it will give us a new overall figure for the drive time down at the bottom there. So this now gives us an ACORN household figure of just under 37,000 
based on propensity for movement, putting it at 2% above the national average. And we're looking at fine margins here, and you might think, ah, it's only 2%, but this is only one example. And you can see from the stats, this catchment shows quite a varied demographic. In areas dominated by specific groups, you'd expect bigger fluctuations. More than likely, you'll also be looking at specific markets. So depending on your business, certain ACORN groups will have a bigger impact. And this can also be applied to all the behavior variables that underpin the ACORN data set. Add to that your local knowledge and shift to domestic tourism this year, and you'll probably find there'll be a lot of people from Darlington and the Northeast traveling to Barnard Castle that would normally be on holiday in France and Spain. And we can drill down into these locations with more data and more granularity to look at the spend and digital inequalities. Modeling the demand is multi-factored depending on your target market. So please get in touch if you'd like to hear more about what is available. And if anyone's wondering about how this is being used locally, we have a case study you can read on how we've helped Westminster Council address the issues facing the West End using the data we've spoken about. It's a really interesting piece that explains how households were encouraged back to the West End by not only providing the right offer, but also making sure it was advertised to the correct demographic groups in the right areas. A hugely successful project which saw an uplift of 50% of visitor football. Now, thanks for listening, everyone. I'm going to pass back to Andy to round things up. Thank you very much, Sam, for that deep dive into that data. So, for those of you who have just seen Sam uh, present that information, and you're thinking that's all very well, but how do I do that? Uh, I just want to summarise some of the key steps, functions, and data that he used. So he started by importing the movement of people data and blended that with the ACORN data. Uh, for this, he built an expression that multiplied one data set to another. He made use of the thematic mapping options to produce most of the maps, using skills taught in the foundations course and across our, our standard training courses. The data he used was the movement of people data along with ACORN at sector level and retail footprint. And he used the drive time functionality to look at the catchment around Barnard Castle and summed up the data using schema links. And finally, a presentation point. He used the map position function to save the map in the midpoint of the location and it saves its scale to make sure all maps uh, look identical when, when pushed out into PowerPoint. Okay, so now to sum up some of those key trends that we looked at from the research. There we go. So as you saw, safety is paramount. Uh, this came out from the survey and, and retail parks are big winners as social distancing is easier in these locations. Communities are keen to stay local. We saw this with the buoyancy of the uh, the retail uh, the, with the rural towns. But this localism does mean that daytime populations could look very different and may well need to feature in future strategies. And as we've seen, inequalities have risen. I showed a graph on financial inequalities, but there are also digital inequalities, and this can lead to increasingly isolated communities. But what this has all shown is a need for an effective strategy to identify and service need. So using both your own data and CACI data, you need to define who your customers are now, what you need to provide for them, where your customers are, are going to be found, how to communicate effectively and identify cus uh, customer need. And crucially, to understand your customers' motivations and requirements. OK, and just then to finish off, just a, re a reminder to please sign up to the, the COVID reports to get the latest data as we publish it. Uh, the links for this are, are on our website and will be on the hub as well.
I'm going to pass back to uh, to Debbie for questions. Thanks, um, Andy and Sam. Just trying to get my video to start again. Um, I really enjoyed that. I hope you all did too and found it really interesting. Um, I think my kind of three takeaways from, from this webinar is um, how you can use the data and information gained from the CACI research and really start to use this in insight to drill down into those areas that might have seen the most movement going forward and how that might impact your, your portfolios uh, or your customers. And also just keeping up to date with the latest reports and information that, that can help inform decisions, you know, making the time to read some of those things and certainly, uh, you know, reiterating Andy's suggestion to sign up if you haven't already to those free uh, COVID reports. And blending data is key. And we've, we've talked about this a lot, I know, in training, when you've been on training with me in the past, and we talk about importing your own data and how useful that is. But here we've seen Acorn, mobile app data and retail footprint combined to give insight. And by adding your own customer or portfolio data into the mix, this will add even more value, I think. So a couple of things to think about there. Um, okay, I um, can't see if there's any questions coming. I've had a couple come in to me direct, but um, if anyone's put any questions in the chat. Um, so one that's come out to me, which I'm going to ask Andy to answer if that's okay, is how do you work out the propensity for each ACORN group to move? Okay, so uh, this is to do with the mobile app data. So uh, by downloading apps to your phone, you're agreeing to your data being captured. Uh, and with your phone being located between the hours of 11 and, and about seven in the morning, those sort of windows, we can work out what ACORN code to assign to them. Uh, and then from there, your, wherever you take your phone, your movement is tracked. And this information is all anonymized and ACORN code and therefore accumulated up to be able to give us the information we've used today. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, what was another one? Um, oh, how do I sign up for the code reports? Well, we're going to put the link um, up on the hub. I'm going to talk about the hub in a second. And um, the link, I think, was in that last uh, slide as well. But if you go onto the CATA website, then there's links in there as well. Um, and then what's this one? Okay, oh, how can we do this for ourselves? So maybe Sam perhaps could just expand a little bit on you know, some of the stuff he did for uh, in actually in Insight. So it's a little bit like if you used to use Market Potential or the recently updated Customer Potential application where you're creating a demand surface. So it's based on um, specific um, propensities for the different ACORN groups. And then you're multiplying that by the population or households uh, within uh, those different groups. And then that gives you your overall figure uh, for a catchment or a retail center whatever you're looking at. And, and, and this sort of stuff could also be applied, those overall percentages to your overall, you, you, your, your own customers if you want to, rather than the, the total households in those catchments. Great, thanks. Um, I can't see any more questions. Can't see any hands up. Okay, well, um, Sam mentioned the Insight Hub um, in as he was talking through and as did Andy, and this is our new resource that will be launched next week um, for, for you guys. So, um, so please look out for emails from us regarding this. You'll all gain access through your own company credentials. So there's no need for a separate login. I'm sure we all don't need to remember another password um, because it's all powered by SharePoint. Um, thank you very much for attending the webinar today. It was really great to see so many users uh, joining us. I hope you found it interesting. Our next webinar um, will be um, in, probably in the next month, um, and it's going to be entitled Using Insight to Assess the Emerging Role of Location. So look out for some more um, emails from us. But if you do have any more questions or you'd like to investigate all these issues further, please send us an email, um, either individually, so either to me, Andy, or Sam, or to insightconsultancy at caci.co.uk, or even to the Insight Helpline. I know you all have that number. So... Um, they will pass on any queries to us. And if you could just put in the subject COVID webinar, that will just help us um, make sure that we've collated them all. So thanks again, all of you for joining us and taking the time out on Friday morning to attend um, and enjoy the rest of your day and the weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>